On this week's Clear Voice, Bishop Edward Braxton of Belleville, Illinois, speaks on the beauty of the new Roman Missal. He explains how it can help Catholics be more attentive and pray more productively. We also begin a three-part series with Monsignor David Yeager, a Franciscan of the Holy Land and currently a judge for the Roman Rota. For many years, he worked as a legal advisor and academic expert on the question of Jerusalem. All that, plus Matt Weber's second week of Advent reflection. Those stories and much more right now on Clear Voice. Hello everyone and welcome to Clear Voice. I'm John Monahan, And I'm Christine Caswell. Monsignor David Yeager was born an Israeli Jew. Born in Tel Aviv, he became a Christian as a teenager. Monsignor Yeager is an expert on the Middle East and has been involved in a number of negotiations in the region. Today, he talks to us as an academic expert on the question of Jerusalem. It was the dilemma that confronted the United Nations organization when it deliberated on dividing the Holy Land between two national states, an Arab-Palestinian state and a Jewish state, and was aware that uh, in the Holy Land there were rights and legitimate interests that belong to a very large part of humanity and that cannot be left for regulation by one national state, or so even by the two states together. Therefore, the United Nations established Jerusalem and its environs as an area under international administration in which the followers of all three religions, uh, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, would uh, uh, have equal rights and would be equally uh, protected by an international administration. An administration that would also look after uh, religious rights and the holy places throughout the rest of the Holy Land. Unfortunately, the peaceful transition that the United Nations had envisaged uh, from British rule to the new arrangement did not come about. As a result of war, Jerusalem was divided between uh, um, an area in the east under Jordanian control and an area in the west under Israeli control, with each side annexing unilaterally the part that it controlled militarily. In 1967, again, the situation on the ground changed when the entire area came under Israeli control. What never changed is the legal situation. Uh, the legal situation being that the, an area of Jerusalem and its environs is not available to any one nation or even to any two nations uh, to decide upon without international approval, uh, without international resolutions that would uh, change the status of an international city, the corpus separatum, a separate territory, and open it up to negotiation between no longer Jordan but Palestine on the one hand and Israel on the other. It is expected, of course, that under present-day conditions, when that happens, uh, uh, the uh, Jerusalem, the areas of Jerusalem, will be uh, distributed between those two national states according to the usual criteria. But that the United Nations will not approve of any disposition unless the purposes that it had in 1947 were met today. This is in essence the question of Jerusalem in relation to the peace process in the Holy Land. Yes, there must be peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians, 
but there must also be an internationally recognized resolution of the need to provide equal protection and freedom for all in Jerusalem and environs. And this can only be done through an international instrument, say a multilateral treaty. The Holy See is on record for many years as insisting on this application of international law on having at least the purposes of the internationalization resolution met before the area is opened up to a political disposition. The most uh, precise and most solemn expression of these expectations of the Catholic Church can now be found in the preamble to the 15th February year 2000 basic agreement between the Holy See and the Palestine Liberation Organization, where in the preamble, uh, in effect, the Palestinian side adheres to the long-standing position of the Holy See that Jerusalem must benefit from an internationally recognized special statute, uh, detailing its main elements, such as the uh, legal equality of the three monotheistic religions, the institutions and their followers throughout the city, the uh, right to religious freedom, freedom of religion and conscience to all within the area of Jerusalem, preservation of the special character of the city of Jerusalem, uh, the uh, observance of the special legal regime called the regime of status quo that governs certain major holy places, as well as, in general, uh, freedom of access to the holy places of the three religions, freedom of worship in them, uh, and uh, freedom of uh, administration of them by those who own them, uh, respectively. These are the main principles. And uh, therefore, it is uh, opportune that uh, as once more, as indeed when has it not been the case, so many voices are heard calling for negotiations for peace in the Holy Land, this particular specific element of any search for peace should be borne in mind. And next week, Monsignor Jaeger talks about peace being critical in the Holy Land. As Americans move out of rural areas toward the cities and suburbs, the church is adjusting to the population shift. Catholic News Service's Julie Asher has a look. A trend continuing today is the movement of people in the U.S. and the profound impact this has on Catholic life and practice. Among the impacts are wholesale parish and school closings and consolidations in older cities and rural towns and pressure to build new facilities churches, schools, and social service institutions to meet the growth of cities and suburbs of the Sun Belt. As a church in the United States, we can become very focused on the issues that surround closing parishes, and often enough that's an area where the population has declined and there are fewer parishioners able to support the infrastructure. And it's the challenge of how to deal with that in the most pastoral way, those realities, without losing uh, touch with the enormous growth that's occurring in other areas. One example in the last 10 years, the Archdiocese of Atlanta has added over uh, 500,000 Catholics to the Catholic population of the Archdiocese. The Archdiocese has been on a great building surge and they have added 10 additional parishes. But when we stop and think that it's 10 additional parishes, but there's 500,000 new Catholics also in a diocese where the parishes basically were full beforehand, that it's still not catching up. And I think we need to kind of attend to that reality of, of the, the huge number in the growth areas that we're still missing. That quite honestly, there's not a space in the parking lot and there's not a, a seat on the pew to bring them into church. And these are folks who are seeking to be connected uh, and that challenge of how to respond to it and yet 
clearly the practical reality of building churches, of staffing and organizing this is quite complex and challenging for the, the diocese there. In Washington, I'm Julie Asher for Catholic News Service. Coming up next on Clear Voice. Because the new translation, uh, being more faithful to the Latin, some of the sentences are longer, a little more complex, sometimes more poetic. Easy and free. Adding Catholic streaming media to your website from all over the nation, the Vatican, and the world just became very simple and absolutely free from Catholic TV. Catholic TV Junior is a small web-based video player that features Catholic television shows, news, special events, and much more. You can embed this user-friendly carousel in the website of your diocese, your parishes, schools, and other Catholic agencies. It's just a click away. At www.catholictvjunior.com, the code can be found to provide this beautiful player for the people whom you serve. Simply copy and paste it into your website, and the player can even be customized with content just for your viewers. Smaller versions are also available. Enhance your presence on the internet. Educate, inspire, and evangelize by adding Catholic TV Junior to your fine website, and the video is always changing. It only takes minutes to add Catholic TV Junior to your site, and everything you need can be found at CatholicTVJunior.com. Your Catholic website will never be the same. From your friends at America's Catholic Television Network, Catholic TV. Now that we're into the second week of the new Roman Missal, many Catholics in the pew are still trying to figure out just how these new terms work. And John, many continue to question why the changes needed to be made. Bishop Edward Braxton, the Bishop of Belleville, Illinois, spoke with Catholic TV's Kevin Nelson. He explains what these new changes can bring to the English-speaking church and how this poetic language can enhance prayer life. And joining us now is uh, Bishop Edward Braxton of Belleville, Illinois. And thank you so much for being with us, I'm Bishop. Happy to be with you. Um, I thought we could talk about the, um, the new changes, the new Roman Missal, and um, I, I know you've um, written about it and, and spoken about it, and I, I wanted to get some of your thoughts on um, the aspect of uh, people coming through with the changes and, and sort of reflecting, being able to reflect more fully on the words and, and how this could possibly lead them into a more deeper understanding of the Mass or more participation in the Mass. Well, of course, it is not primarily a change in the Mass, but simply a more complete translation of the Missale Romanum. And I think for some people, there may have been the feeling that, oh, this is a big burden, there was something we have to deal with. Actually, it's not a burden at all. I think it's an opportunity to be embraced, not a burden to be endured. I think it's an opportunity for deacons, priests, bishops, and the, the Christian faithful who assemble for liturgy and religious to renew their spirituality through the liturgy. It provides us with a kind of Lexio Divina, a kind of spiritual reading, if you will, because the new translation, uh, being more faithful to the Latin, some of the sentences are longer, a little more complex, sometimes more poetic, makes us necessarily slow down. Priests must slow down. There are periods, commas, semicolons, pauses. Uh, words must be enunciated clearly because they're new words. So I hope that we priests, when we pray the Mass, will take advantage of this opportunity and overcome any bad habits we may have learned of rushing through the Mass and that our people will also listen in a more uh, leisurely way, if you will, to hear the words and to turn over in their hearts the meaning of the words. As Mary turned over in her heart the meaning of the Incarnation, the word in her, we must turn over the meaning of the words of the Eucharistic prayer in our own hearts. So I think it becomes an opportunity really for spiritual growth through a really a kind of Lectio Divina. And, and you, you mentioned too, and I read about um the, the poetic aspect of, of the uh, words, too, and, and how um, it really is, it's a bit of poetry in, in the translation. Well, there, there's a paradox. In, in one sense, some thought the prior translation was more poetic, but in another sense, by being more faithful to the Latin and more fully incorporating the imagery, uh, there is a great deal of poetry if it is proclaimed properly. And in the uh, uh, address that I'm giving to the bishops later on, I speak to the bishops about even comparisons you can make between uh, the way T.S. Eliot writes or the way uh, especially Jared Manny Hopkins writes and some of the beautiful lines in their poetry, uh, not that the text of the Mass is written in the same fashion, but they are both using words, uh, they're bending language in a way to try to uh, create an inbreak into the realm of the sacred, into the realm of the spiritual by precisely not using everyday language. I think some people uh, 
uh, had thought that, well, the translation that's been in place since the council is very informal in their view. And sometimes some priests have taken even liberties with that and making it even more informal. But in a certain sense, the prayers of the Mass are not everyday language. It's a, it's a very specialized language that is intended to help the priest celebrant to pray publicly and to lead the people to pray publicly. And through the words and the pauses, pauses are extremely important in prayer and in poetry, to help us to enter into uh, the realm of the sacred, the realm of the, uh, of the holy. The, uh, the words are translated in a way that I think makes us much more aware of what Rudolf Otto called the Mysterium Tremendum, the Tremendous Mystery. Uh, and so that I, I think that um, the, the new translation requires effort, but it's an effort that would be beneficial spiritually if we bring to it a positive openness to the work of the Holy Spirit and the way that words work. Uh, uh, Confucius once, worked, once wrote that we must put words right, and we must put them right in how we proclaim them and how we listen to them. We cannot sit passively at Mass, but actively. And sometimes when we hear a novel word, it may jar us, but it ultimately can direct us into a deeper appreciation of what the church is doing in public prayer. And I, I think, too, uh, as you were mentioning, that uh, people do or had gotten into these routines, uh, you know, where they would go to Mass and everything was just sort of automatic. And, and, it, and it sounds like with this now, people, uh, you know, with some effort can, can really find themselves participating a lot more. Well, we hope so. You know, once in a while, we bishops hear uh, people say, well, we like Father so-and-so in our parish because he, he does a 25-minute special at the Mass is over in less than half an hour, and certainly less than an hour you know, on a Sunday, as if that is the goal, the faster the better. Whereas uh, in prayer, uh, some of our great saints spent hours sitting in prayer just pondering uh, a few words. The great Edith Stein, uh, uh, Sister Teresa Benedict of the Cross, Saint Teresa Benedict of the Cross, said that just the words, Our Father, the first words of the Pater Noster, could lead her to two hours of meditation, just turning over, uh, over the meaning of the words. And so I, I think our American culture tends to say, rush, 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 and prayer says, slow down, slow down, wasting time in the presence of the Lord. And so that I think that uh, uh, when they hear the prayers prayed reflectively, I hope the people will, will think about them. I mean, even, even unusual, I mean, many people say, well, it's perfectly normal to say the Lord be with you and also with you. Why must we say and with your spirit? Uh, we're not talking about the person's spirit, we just want the Lord to be with this person. But if they think about it and understand the priest is receiving that response and with your spirit, that the assembly is saying with you, with the, with the spirit with the, which is in you as you exercise this unique ministry as the one who celebrates the sacred mysteries. So you're not just saying, have a nice day and you too. It's the Lord be with you, the, the priest celebrant to the congregation, to the assembly, and they back to him, to the priest or bishop, and with your spirit, that is with you with the charism and the gifts and the grace that is needed for this sacred celebration. But you have to think about that uh, in order to grasp why the nuance has been added in the translation. Bishop Braxton is the Episcopal liaison to the National Organization for Continuing Education of Roman Catholic Clergy. He recently wrote an article in the Priest magazine entitled, The New Roman Missal, An Opportunity to Embrace, Not a Burden to be Endured. The Sisters of St. Clair in Lima, Peru, are busy at work making their famous Panettone cakes. Catholic News Service takes us inside the convent to talk with the sisters and learn about this tradition. Every November in the heart of Old Lima, a group of sisters wash their hands, fire up their ovens, and get to work. What are they baking? A heavenly dessert brought to Peru by Italian immigrants decades ago. The Panettone. It's a Peruvian tradition that has become a godsend opportunity for some, and it's all hands on deck this time of the year, as the nuns expect to sell 60,000 cakes by Christmas. The orders are already coming in. The St. Clair nuns of Lima have been making panettone for 20 years and have perfected the recipe. The panettone is soft, spongy, and it has a special flavor. It's the flavor of the love we put into it. It tastes like God. The cloister of 40 nuns is self-sustaining. While prayer feeds their souls, the Panettone helps give them a living wage and maintain their 400-year-old convent. There is a time for everything. We work when we have to work. But our main job is praying. 
That's what we're dedicated to. That is the promise we've made to God, to pray. The penitent you buy from us is blessed. Why? Because it is made by a consecrated soul. All 40 of us beg penitents. Our hands have been blessed by God. So we beg with love. Not because we earn money from it. I do it out of my love for God and for the salvation of souls. The success of all work depends on prayer. If one prays and asks the Lord to help, he will listen. From Lima, this is Ellie Gardner for Catholic News Service. Coming up next on Clear Voice. This random guy on TV, the religious programming celebrity, here's this week's advice. Hi everyone, I'm Jay Fadden and on behalf of the entire staff here at Catholic TV and your fellow parishioners of the airwaves, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your affirmation and support. And during this very special time of year, I'd ask that you consider making a donation to Catholic TV. I'm sure you realize it's not easy to run a network of this size, but it's so important. Because in today's world, there's so many distractions. And it's important that we bring the loving message of Jesus into homes because it makes a difference in people's lives. You can't imagine the difference it makes. Maybe you're one of those people. So won't you consider making a donation to Catholic TV, helping us continue this ministry? Know that all of you are in our thoughts and prayers, and I ask you to do whatever you can do. Here's the address to send that donation. says that it is important for us to find long-lasting solutions for world hunger and not to just send food to the hungry. Rome Reports takes us to the Vatican for more on the Pope's meeting and Caritas Internationalis. Benedict XVI met with Italian volunteers from the group Caritas Internationales, the leading Catholic NGO in the world. The Pope told them that addressing the needs of others is not just to give bread to the hungry, but also to address the root causes of hunger among which the Pope pointed to the current economic crisis. Spesso calamita, calamita naturali e guerre creano situazioni di emergenza. La crisi economica globale è un ulteriore segno dei tempi che chiede il coraggio della fraternità. Il divario tra nord e sud del mondo e la lesione della dignità umana di tante persone richiamano ad una carità che sappia allargarsi a cerchi concentrici dai piccoli ai grandi sistemi economici. The meeting marked the 40th anniversary of Caritas in Italy. The Pope noted that thanks to Caritas, those in need have not felt abandoned by God. He also praised the success record from this Catholic NGO, saying it served as an example for all of society. Cari amici, non desistete mai da questo compito educativo anche quando la strada si fa dura e lo sforzo sembra non dare risultati. Caritas in Italy has been a branch of the Italian Episcopal Conference since its founding in 1971, working for the welfare of the needy, helping them to find work, and working for the equality of immigrants. And now let's take a look at the many significant events that have taken place this week in the church. This week in the church on December 9, 1531, Our Lady of Guadalupe first appeared to St. Juan Diego, an Aztec Indian convert on Tipiac Hill, right outside present-day Mexico City. On December 11, 1792, Joseph Moore, the Austrian Roman Catholic vicar who authored the enduring Christmas hymn, Silent Night, was born. On December 12, 1531, Our Lady appeared for a third time to St. Juan Diego and told him to pick the Castilian roses which had miraculously appeared. He then brought them to the bishop in his tilma or coat and when he opened his tilma, the image of Our Lady appeared on it. As a result, 
A church was built in Our Lady's honor and human sacrifice ended in Mexico. On December 14, 1997, in preparation for Pope John Paul II's visit to Cuba, the communist country's president, Fidel Castro, declared Christmas of 1997 an official holiday. And those are just a few of the events that happened this week in the church. This week, our friend Matt Weber reflects on the second week of Advent. His advice, enjoy the silence. A lot easier said than done. Here's a word with Weber. Happy second week of Advent. So close to that pink candle, but alas, more purple, which is actually my third favorite color, little Matt Weber trivia. Now, last week I told you we're going to switch things up a little bit on Word with Weber for Advent. And I must say, a little bit less about me, a little bit more about you. After all, in the words of a good friend who I think works here, it's all for you. So in the hopes that you listen to this random guy on TV, the religious programming celebrity, here's this week's advice. I don't want you to close your eyes. I want you to stare intently at the TV and do exactly and say exactly what I do and say. Now repeat after me. I, state your name, am going to learn, I'm going to learn this Advent season, this Advent season, to embrace, to embrace the many joys, the many joys of silence. It's amazing what becomes most present when you stop to not just smell the roses, but to listen to the roses, or anything else for that matter that doesn't make noise. Leave the iPod at home one day this week. Mute the TV during commercials. You may find silence to be refreshing. But be sure not to mute John and Christine, they still need to close out the show. You know, Christine, it's no easy thing to keep quiet for a while. Are you making a reference to me? Just in general, just in general, of course. <laughs> well, that is our show for this week. I'm not going to be quiet. I'm Christine Caswell. Thanks for being with us. No surprise there. And I'm John <laughs> Monahan. We hope to see you again next week for another edition of Clear Voice. <laughs>